In this unit, we're going to discuss the two-dimensional topological insulator, or equivalently, the quantum spin hole effect. This is the first phase that introduced and really started the revolution of topological classification of matter after the quantum hole effect, and we will look at it through the eyes of the Kane and Millet model. First, we're going to recap the uh, physics, the essential physics of graphene. So we consider an uh, electron on a hexagonal lattice. We have the uh, nearest neighbor hopping term, uh, where these uh, di brackets denote nearest neighbor coupling. And we have a possible on-site energy or mass term that we will consider later. We can Fourier transform this Hamiltonian into momentum space, which then can take a very compact form, which is just this momentum dependent d vector dot a sigma uh, vector of Pauli matrices. These Pauli matrices, again, act on the site basis uh, AB or IJ sites of the lattice. The spectrum related to this Hamiltonian is simply given by the magnitude of the d-vector. This d-vector vanishes at six points across the Brillouin zone. These are the locations of the Dirac bands that are located at the k and the k' prime edges of the Brillouin zone. What are the components of this d-vector? First of all, we have the dx component, which is value dependent. It has a positive sign on the k value and a negative sign on the k prime value. We have the velocity here, which is directly proportional to the hopping amplitude times the lattice constant, and a linear term in the momentum expansion away from these uh, zero points, the k and k prime points in the Brillouin zone. Similarly, on the dy uh, term, we have just the velocity times qy, and on the Z dz term of the d vector, we have this on-site mass that we may consider uh, in a moment. However, when we consider graphene, which has a Dirac dispersion, this linear dispersion uh, in momentum, we assume we take this mass term to zero, and from it we get the famous well-known spectrum of graphene having a Dirac spectrum at the k and k prime values. So this is the physics of graphene. What we're going to do next is consider two different types of insulators that can be derived from the uh, graphene sheet. One would be a trivial insulator, and the second would be the topological insulator. We'll start from the trivial insulator, which we obtain by considering a bipartite lattice. In the bipartite lattice, we assign different masses on site A and site B. They are no longer equivalent, and the mass difference is equal to M. What we get as a result is this revised spectrum, which has a mass term. This is no longer a Dirac dispersion. This is a dispersion of an insulator with a gap of the order of 2m, and parabolic dispersion about this gap. So we have an insulator. How can we tell if this is a trivial insulator or topological insulator? For this, we can consider the atomic limit. What we do here is expand our lattice and increase the lattice constant basically to infinity. While the lattice constant increases, also the hopping term is attenuated, but it is exponentially sensitive to the separation between atoms. Therefore, overall, the v velocity of the electrons will go to zero because the hopping term is attenuated faster than uh, the growth of the lattice constant. What this means is that we end with two resonances at plus and minus m, separated again by an energy gap of 2m, and these resonances are basically the orbitals from which we construct the graphene sheet. However, along this evolution, we did not have to close at any point this 2m gap, which means that the gap that we induced in the uh, graphene sheet, this insulating gap is topologically equivalent to the gap that we have in the atomic limit. Next, we can also take m to infinity, 
and obtain the vacuum. So we've seen how we can get a trivial insulator out of the graphene Hamiltonian. Next, let's see how we can get a two-dimensional topological insulator out of it. For it, we'll consider the kanan millet model. What kanan millet added to the Hamiltonian is a spin orbit term, which you can see here. The spin orbit term has a additional second hopping parameter, and it acts on next nearest neighbors. It gives a complex, uh, an imaginary hopping amplitude when the electron hops between next nearest neighbors. And in addition, we have this orbital term here, which is positive on clockwise hops and negative on anticlockwise hoppings. And this couples to the spin of the electron. This is the spin orbit term, which we can again write in a compact form, and it obtained this uh, form that you see here below, where we have the spin orbit strength, which is directly proportional to the T2 hopping term. We have tau z, which is a Pauli matrix acting on the valley degree of freedom. We have sigma z, which is a Pauli matrix acting on the side degree of freedom. And we have sz, which is a Pauli matrix acting on the spin degree of freedom of the electrons. What we have here is two copies of the Haldane model, and these copies are time-reversed partners. Each copy is a copy of uh, the Haldane model, one for spin up, the other for spin down. So let me remind you what was the Haldane model that you met before in our course. In the Haldane model, we consider a non-uniform magnetic field across the lattice, which is pointing in one direction, let's assume out of plane in the center of the zone, and in the opposite direction on the edges of the Brillouin zone. And of course, we can consider the time reverse partner with opposite magnetic fields. We know that when we solve this Hamiltonian, we get a chiral head modes which reside on the edges of this Haldane sheet. This chiral edge mode has well-defined chirality, and each time reverse copy of the Haldane model will have a chiral edge mode cycling in the opposite direction, having the opposite spin of its electron. So basically, what we expect to get out of this kane millet model when we superimpose these two copies is helical edge modes, which are two copies of chiral edge modes where spin up is coupled to one chirality and spin down is coupled to the opposite chirality. And as long as we retain time reversal symmetry, they will not gap out and hybridize with one another. Let's see how we get it by actually solving the kane millet hamiltonian So all we have to consider now is how the d vector changes or the dz component of the d vector changes when we introduce spin orbit coupling. What we get for the dz component is now a term that looks like this and in particular depends and has opposite signs on the k and the k prime values. What this means is that again we'll induce a gap at the Dirac dispersion, however this gap will have opposite signs on the k and the k prime values. If we introduce again the bipartite lattice, we'll add a uniform mass term, which will be added or subtracted from the spin orbit gap. And what this means is that we, we may have a situation where we gain a negative gap on some values and a positive gap on others. So we've seen that uh, we can get positive and negative signs of gap on the k and the k prime values of the kane millet model. Let's see what are the consequences on the boundaries of this graphene sheet. For this, we'll consider explicitly the following Hamiltonian. So again, we have the linear in momentum term, qx and qy. In this case, the qx term is coupled to the valley degree of freedom and has opposite signs on the k and k prime uh, valleys. And we have the generalized mass term that has the always positive uh, bipartite contribution and the uh, sometimes negative spin orbit contribution. What we'll consider next is the boundary between two graphene sheets, half infinite. On one side, we'll assume 
a positive gap, only a bipartite lattice. On the other side, we'll consider a bipartite lattice that has spin orbit coupling, the Kane Millet model, which may have a negative gaps in its spectrum. And what we'll see is what happens at the interface between these two half infinite planes. All we need to do is consider only those terms in the Hamiltonian that may contribute a negative mass term, and there are only two of them. One comes from the k-valley, let's assume that this is the plus sign, which then has to couple to the negative spin contribution, which we will consider as the up spin. And if we consider the minus, the k-prime valley, we have to consider the other type of spin in order to get overall a negative contribution. So we see that the spin is coupled to the very degree of freedom, but the very degree of freedom also dictates the sign of the qx term in the Hamiltonian. For the qy term, we go back to real space coordinates because along this direction, the Hamiltonian is no longer translational invariant. We can immediately solve this Hamiltonian along the x-direction, which is still the translational invariant, and we know that we will get a plane wave. And when we solve it, we get the following interesting spectrum, where spin up has a positive velocity, and spin down has a negative velocity. So the velocity, and the sign of the velocity, is directly coupled to the sign of the spin. What we actually got here is a helical mode. Spin up travels in one direction, spin down travels in the opposite direction. The only question that we don't know yet is what happens along the y direction. So let's solve this explicitly. We use this ansatz, this exponentially decaying uh, form of the wave function, where in the exponent we uh, just integrate the uh, Hamiltonian and get an integral which has only the mass term on its half plane inside the integrand. However, we take a negative sign for the positive half plane where we have a negative mass term and a positive sign when we have a positive mass term. So overall, both these contribution give us an exponentially decaying profile as we go away from the boundary and some shape of a wave function which is directly dictated by the exact details of the mass term, how it flips from positive to negative across the interface, but we are assured that when we go far enough from that interface, the wave function will decay, which means that indeed what we obtain here is a helical edge mode, spin up going one way, spin down going the other way, which is exponentially localized on the interface between a kane millet model and a trivial insulator. Of course, for the trivial insulator, we don't have to consider a bipartite lattice. We can also consider any insulator, including vacuum. And in this case, all the boundaries of the kane millet model will have their helical edge modes surrounding their boundaries. So just to summarize what we've seen for the characteristics of the two-dimensional topological insulator is that by inducing a negative gap, possibly by spin-orbit coupling, we must obtain helical edge modes. This is the bulk boundary correspondence between the topological inverted gap of the bulk and the boundary modes, the exotic unique boundary modes that we get on the edges, which in this case are helical edge modes these are just two copies of the Haldane model, time-reversed copies, and they remain protected as long as we keep time-reversal symmetry. If we break time-reversal symmetry, they can mix and hybridize with each other and gap out. These are the properties of the two-dimensional topological insulator. Mm -hmm.